Hours of Christ Fellowship with Dr. Stephen Gray. Thank you, Lord, for, for this day. Thank you for what you've, you're doing in our midst. Thank you for your love for us. We ask you to anoint this word today, direct us, and guide us. Open our ears and eyes and our spirits to receive what you have for each and every one of us. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. This week, I got a call from, I won't mention his name, well, you know, our friend Eddie, I'll use his first name. Eddie called and uh, I don't know what he was wanting to talk about or if he had anything on his mind. But he, he started saying, he said, I've never seen it like it is right now. And, uh, you know, he said, it's like people want to take us back to the Middle Ages uh, you got the you got the mainline churches that are speaking against the Pentecostals, and the Pentecostals are speaking against the mainline churches. I've never seen such a such a chaotic uh, display in my life. And I want to share something with you. I, I, I think I've said this before. Is that um. When I was in Bible school, one of, my, one of the worst courses I thought was going to be systematic theology. And I thought, oh, this is going to be terrible. And as I got into it, uh, I, it became one of my favorite courses. And essentially what they teach you is how that the Bible is an evolving revelation. And one of the things they teach you is when you're selecting the the eight great doctrines of the Bible God the Son the Holy Spirit would be three of those you can't have a doctrine from the Bible that is in disagreement with other parts of the Bible that's one of the things they teach you how to find truth and yet you have people that develop doctrine one of those that you hear about a lot is cessationism and, and they believe basically that the gifts are gone when you've got a, a large percentage of Christians that believe the gifts are still operating and, and have lived in them as I have for years. And yet the Bible says things like forbid in 1 Corinthians 14, 39, it says don't forbid speaking in tongues. And yet they forbid speaking in tongues. Um, there's Mark 16, 17, which is, one of the verses God has personally given me, it says, And these signs will follow those who believe, not the leaders, not the pastors, those who believe. Mm -hmm. In my name, they'll cast out demons. You don't see a lot of that going on. They'll speak with new tongues. They're trying to forbid that in many places. They'll take up serpents. I'm not big on that, but if you wanted to do that, I guess you could. Uh, it will been, by no means hurt you. And I think that more has to do if you're out like Paul was and he got snake bit, it didn't, it didn't affect him. They'll lay hands on the sick and they will recover. And we're not seeing that. So here's my question. Why wouldn't people look at a verse like this and go, how about the one that says they have a form of godliness, yet they deny the power they're in? And so if it was like me years ago when I was a young man, I started saying, God, there's got to be more. I just felt in me there's more. And I went to Africa and, and I wasn't trying to make nothing happen. The whole book of Acts opened up. Amen. So I'm here to tell you that there's something coming. And... um. I have to I have to give a little bit of a testimony because I haven't I'm you know it's like the, Paul Harvey used to say I got to tell you now the whole story the rest of the story I was real discouraged probably five or six years ago a lot of it had to do with my family at the time and I decided one day I was just leaving and I got my car and I started driving west 
And uh, I said, I don't know where I'm going or how far I'm going. I'm just driving away. God just said, get in your car and drive away. I guess he was like saying, go ahead and run. Run till you get tired, you know. So I got somewhere in Texas. I don't remember exactly where. And I swear to y'all, I'm driving down the interstate. And I mean, God came in that car and said, turn around. And... I don't even think I obeyed. I think he took the wheel and I just went up the next exit. And when I got to the top of that exit, the glory of God came in the car and the Lord said, turn around and I'm going to restore the glory back to you the way it was before. And now you got to realize I've been in the glory ever since 1999. But those first 10 years were different. And I could, I could tell you, I, I could speak to a group of people. Uh, I could go to, a, a lot of people would have me come into offices and talk to employees. And I remember one time I was speaking to a group about 20 women. They were, it was in an office. And I started just telling them about Jesus. And they all started crying and started weeping and wailing. And I was like, man, what is going on? So... I heard a word. It wasn't a word I got, but it was a word that God confirmed to me when he said, I'm going to restore the glory. Now, we've, we've been in the glory almost every service. If not, it's definitely on Monday nights. But what God's talking about is bringing the seraphim back. Now, you say, well, what are the seraphim? Well, if you go to Revelation chapter 4, where John's getting a picture of the throne of God. And in there he says, uh, he describes, beginning in verse 6, he describes what the throne looks like. He describes these creatures that are made up of six wings and all kinds of crazy features. And then in verse 8, he says, the four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around within. And they do not rest their night, saying, as they're circling around the throne room, they say, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And when it says, whenever the living creatures give glory and honor, thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders all fall down before him who sits on the throne to worship him. Whether this was literal or figurative, we don't know. But I want to tell you that what those are is seraphim that are flying around the throne that he's describing. And we see that, we see seraphim showing up in scripture, which we'll look at in just a minute. But I want to tell you what's happening as they fly around this throne and they look, at, they, they look at God and they see a different aspect of God's glory. They cry out, holy, holy, holy. And you think, well, how long has this been going on f since the beginning of time? So you, can you imagine when I was in Africa one time, I, I was caught up in the spirit and I saw a picture of the throne. I didn't know what it was. But I couldn't see a chair or anybody sitting there. I saw a prism of light, a, a broad spectrum of like you were looking in a prism with different colors. And I heard the Lord say, my glory is infinite. I didn't know what that meant. But it means God's attributes are infinite. You know, John says eternal life is to know God. I believe we're going to spend all eternity getting to know our God. And that's what these seraphims are doing. They're just, they keep going around in a circle and they're going, whoa, holy, holy, holy. They get another revelation of God's glory. So it's exciting to me that we, this is the God we know. This is the God that we have. But I have to tell you, it is really discouraging. In the last week, I kind of had a, I guess you'd call it a pity party. And I was like, man, this world is in a mess. And, and I'm not talking about people. I'm talking about pastors and leaders. They're just, 
It's just crazy some of the stuff people are saying. I, it's almost like if you, whatever doctrine you want, you can find somebody on, their t on the internet or TV teaching it. So anyway, God was reminding me about the glory coming back. If you'd ever heard, and I've shown some of you some of the videos from Africa, where you see people in the room, and, and there's, it, does, it just starts, usually when you give an altar call, and they're just weel, what, weeping and wailing and, and hollering, you know, to God. Just, you don't hear that in American churches. But I want you to tell, tell you that's what's coming. There's a holiness. And I'm, I'm telling you, God's coming to purge His church. Now, if you're watching this video by home, I would, I, I'm speaking to this church. And I says, you know, we've all been going through an intense preparation. God's been working on everybody. In our house, Kathy, me, you, I, I just see it all over. God is doing such a tremendous work in people's lives. I've seen more change in people in the last six months than I have in six years. And so, you know, as I've been looking at what's coming, God brought to mind a story in Isaiah 6. And uh, I believe, you know, we've all talked about April 8th, about this total eclipse of the sun. My wife has been hearing for over three or four years about it's not time to go to Nineveh. And now we find out that there are seven cities in America called Nineveh, and they're all in the path of this eclipse. So we feel like God's saying it's going to be time to go to Nineveh real soon. Um, but I want you to see what this seraphim is. It is, a, it is not just a normal angel. It is an angel that carries the fire of God, the passion of God, the holiness of God. So Isaiah chapter 6 verse 1 says this. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne. The first thing we want to understand is it was the year the king of the, of the uh, country, that king died. The year the king died, he says, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne. And I, I thought today, we, we're looking to government, we're looking to man, we're looking to leaders. Until man dies, until our own strength dies, we're not going to see the Lord. He says, I, th I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Now you have to kind of be a history major or person to understand what the train was. If you ever seen a king come in or a queen and they had that long flowing uh, piece of fabric behind them. And a lot of times they'd have somebody carrying them something that goes so long. And if you looked at a king's train, if it was properly made, it had emblems sewn in it. And all those emblems sewn in the train were pictures of different aspects of his victories his battles, his successes. And so when it says, I saw the Lord lifted up and I saw his train filling the temple, it's talking about the glory. It's talking about all the attributes, all the character traits, all the aspects of your God. That's why he says the train of his robe filled the temple. So we see the year the king died of that country, Uzziah, the Lord's lifted up and it's, he's filling the glory with, his, with the house. He's filling the house with his glory. And then in verse 2 it says, Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face. Two he covered his feet. And two he flew. 
And one cried to another, and I read this to you earlier. This is a picture of the throne of God. Said, holy, 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 the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Now we know that one hasn't happened yet, but I believe this is a prophetic picture of what's coming. Joel 2 talks about a former and a latter rain. When Peter quotes that in Acts, he quotes it with, not correctly because he doesn't use the word afterward because he's talking about the former rain. That was Pentecost. But there's a latter rain coming. And it says even it's going to be in the first month when the latter rain comes. And that's the religious Jewish calendar. And that's in April. And that's when the eclipse is. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. So something's coming. It says, and the whole earth is full of his glory. That's a back of 214. For the knowledge of the glory will fill the earth as the waters cover the sea. Um, I told Eddie, I reminded Eddie, we were in a meeting in, in Africa, in Nairobi. And uh, there was about 20 pastors, maybe 30. And we were just walking around in Kabachia's church and you know we're just praying in tongues and walking around praying and all of a sudden Eddie goes I hear a prophetic declarative and he speaks Habakkuk 2 14 and he said it so fast and God fell immediately to the point where every one of those pastors went to the floor I mean it was like when God shows up like that you can't stand the priests in the Old Testament couldn't stand when the glory came in. They'd be on their faces. They couldn't minister. And that's what was going on there. And we were just like, whoa. So later I said to Eddie, I said, what did you say? And he said, I, I quoted, I heard the Lord say, Habakkuk 2.14 is a prophetic, meaning it, he said, declared it's coming. It's like, Wow. So go back to Isaiah 6. It said, The post of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. Whew! That is not going to be a normal time when God shows up like that. Verse 5, So I said, Woe is me, for I'm undone. If there is no other response to God showing up like this, then woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips. Let me just say this to you. When I was in Africa and the glory was so heavy, and I started seeing this, and I could give you so many different examples, the glory would come into a church and bring either one of two things. It'd bring blessing or curse. It'd bring judgment. It'd bring blessing or judgment. And I believe it brought blessing in some church because they repented. I remember a small church. I showed up there. I'm not sure where it was. Honestly, I think it was somewhere in Arusha, Tanzania. And um, it was, it, they had a dirt floor. And they said the landlord was trying to steal, get their land back. And they wanted to, they wanted to make the church bigger because they had so many people. And, and I, I preached some message, I don't remember what it was, but I remember all those elders in suits came forward and laid on that dirt floor and wailed and wept and repented. And I went to another church that afternoon and the pastor wouldn't even come in the service. He stayed in his house. He said, you go preach. Come to find out later, when I taught at the Bible school about, I don't know, three or four months later, here comes the, both those churches, their leaders. There was the woman, the pastor's wife of the second church. The first church had, had the pastor. He said, oh, Pastor Steve, it's been amazing. God's blessed us. He's given us more land. The landlord's welcomed us in. Everything's going great. The second church, the guy that where they didn't come in there, his wife said, my husband and I are getting a divorce. He's had an affair with the house girl, and they've kicked him out. And I said, yeah, that's the way it goes. You either get blessed or you get judgment. And that's what's upon the church right now. 
I mean, I've never seen the things being exposed. It's like, man, if you ain't living right, it's getting ready to come out in the open. I, I began to realize that when Jesus showed up in Scripture, wherever he went, he brought truth. When you bring truth, his kind of truth, you're either going to expose people's sin and they're going to repent or they're going to deny it or run from it. Do you know, I was even looking and saying that there are pastors lately that are dying in the pulpit. Right when they're preaching, they're having heart attacks. I saw a man, who so wasn't a pastor, but I saw an a, a ambassador, a politician in another country was cursing Israel and fell down dead in the pulpit or the platform, the podium. And it's like, you know what? God is not fooling around anymore. So I'm saying to you, when this thing comes to the church, it's coming. And I think God's trying to get us ready. I hope you're getting ready at home. But God's trying to get us ready. And when this thing comes, you better repent. You better get on your face. You think, well, I'm, I'm pretty, doing pretty good. Well, you ain't going to be doing good when that spirit that seraphim shows up and brings that holiness and brings that full glory, you're going to be undone. That's the way Isaiah was. I am undone. Here's the prophet of God saying, I'm a man of unclean lips. So he's going to, that glory, that level will take us down to such a purging and cleansing level. It's going to be sobering, to say the least. But why? Why is God doing this? He's getting his bride ready. But listen to what Isaiah says in chapter uh, 6, verse 5. He said, So I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of, of a people of unclean lips. That sounds like prophecy for today. For my eyes have seen the king. I've seen his glory. I've, I've experienced him. The Lord of hosts. Now look what happens in verse 6. Then it says, Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he got from the very throne of God, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your inequity is taken away. Your, your desire for sin, the, the generational sins on you, your sins are purged, he says. And that's what these, these seraphim are coming to the church to do, is to purge people of sins. Those that will admit and repent will be purged and cleansed. And the, what, this level of cleansing you've never experienced before. This is, this is a holiness that I've not seen very much in America. But it's coming. And God wants to purge us. If you, if you refuse this, it's not going to be good. I don't want to scare anybody. But I believe people, leaders will be, fall dead or run out the door. I don't know what it's going to look like, but it's going to be a serious time of purging on the church. And my gosh, do we not need it. Verse 8, I also heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? That's why he's coming to purge us, y'all. He's coming to purge us because when you get purged and cleaned up, he's going to say, now, let's go. Let's go minister to the people. And he said, go and tell this people, keep on hearing, but do, who keep on hearing, but they don't understand. Keep on seeing, but they don't perceive. Because you're going to be, have the fire of the seraphim on you. And it, it's, it's the glory, but it's, it's the holiness of God. And y'all, when you're walking with that, it's signs and wonders like you cannot believe.
I think it's funny because I, I don't know how this will play out, but I can imagine seeing churches, I want to mention the denomination, that are denying the power of the Holy Spirit. And this shows up, there are going to be some eyes getting real big. Some of these pastors are saying, yeah, their tongues are not for today. I hope your old church speaks in tongues and you're sitting there watching it. You're denying the Holy Spirit when you say stuff like that. They say, well, it, it stopped with the apostles. And I said, well, if you really understood those gifts, why in the world would God ever stop those gifts? The church needs those gifts. I said, where in the Bible does it say that anything's going to stop? As a matter of fact, it indicates it's going to continue. So, you know why they say it stopped? Because it's not in their life. And God answered that when I was coming back from Africa. He said, they worship me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Your hearts, you're, you've lost your passion. So anyway, verse 11 let me start in verse 10. It says, Make the heart of this people dull, their ears heavy, sh and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and return and be healed. Then I said, Long, Lord, how long? He answered, Until the cities are laid waste, and without inhabitant, the houses are without a man, and the land is utterly decimate. God is bringing a, a judgment or a blessing. You decide what you're going to accept. Verse 12, the Lord has removed men far away and he has forsaken places. Are many in the midst of the land? I see this, this chapter 6 in Isaiah as a prophetic word about what's coming now. They, they, we've never seen anything like this in history. Verse 13, but a tenth will be in it and will return and be for consuming as a terrible tree or as an oak whose stump remains when it is cut down. So the holy seed shall be its stump. That holy seed that God, the remnant church, is ready and looking and waiting for this. Holiness to come. Someone asked me this week, he's not here this morning, what do I see coming? And, and as I always do, I said, well, I thought I'm not really sure. And immediately God started answering that question. And this is what's coming. Boy, we sure need it. But, you know, it's not always going to be the most pleasant thing when you're laying on the floor bawling your eyes out and broken because you see where you are and where God is. But we, we've got to be prepared for what's coming. And God's trying to, that's why, that's why you, it's almost like you think God's being mean to you because he's pressing, 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 Dealing with you, putting you through trials and tribulations. So I just say to you, I'm praying for you. Let us all pray for one another. Let us get ready. God is, here's the good news. God ain't going to leave us in the mess we're in. Here's the bad news. It may not be as pleasant in the beginning as we expected, but it's okay. It'll be glorious. Let's pray. Father, thank you. So much for what you're doing. We give you praise and glory. We thank you, God, for this word today. We thank you, God, for your promise to come and cleanse the church. We invite your seraphim and your cherubim, your angels of God, to come forth and bring this great awakening. We give you praise and glory. Lord, we repent for our stubborn ways our selfish ways, Lord, and direct our steps. Cleanse us, cleanse our lips of the things we speak. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.